Hi guys, my name is Lyra Laterna with Pangolin Laser Systems, and in this video we're going to cover the basics of what a laser projector is, what the different components are inside, with how they work, and how this technology comes together to help you make amazing laser displays. If you still have questions following this video, feel free to send us an email at support at pangolin.com. You'll also find links to different free resources such as our ebook and educational blog posts in the description below. On this screen, you'll see a selection of the chapters and their timestamps. You can check in the description for links to those timestamps. All right, let's get started. To provide a simple definition, a laser projector is a system allowing you to project laser content in a controlled and specified area. This could be consisted of laser beam projections, aerial laser projections, liquid sky effects, laser text, graphics, or logos, and many more. Laser projectors are often used for the creation of laser shows, as you might see at a nightclub, festival, concert, or tour, but can also be used for architectural lighting, projection mapping, as well as for industrial applications. Now that we have defined what a laser projector is, let's take a look at the projector I have here and see how it truly works. Here we have a Quant Clubmax 3000 FB4. The reason we're choosing for the Clubmax is because it's a great example that contains most, if not all, of the modern features that you'd find in a current laser projector. From the outside, we can see the laser's housing. On the model that we are using, it has an IP54 rating, which can vary amongst all different laser projectors. Some more affordable ones might have a lower or no IP rating, and permanently installed outdoor lasers can have an IP rating of IP56 or even higher sometimes. On the front of the laser, we have a few different things that we can see. First is our masking plate. This is a metal plate in front of the aperture, which allows you in transport to cover the glass, and also when you're on a show, to mask off part of the area of the projection. This is good to keep stray beams out of the audience. Other than that, we can see our glass plate, which is where the lasers come out of, and then also our emission indicator, which is a law in some places for the front, so that we know that if the emission indicator is on, then lasers could be outputted from the machine. Then we can see our mounting bracket. This will allow us to mount our projector to trussing with clamps and other types of things where we can maybe screw it in. What's cool about this feature is actually have a 360 degree yoke. So we can mount it all the way upside down or forward. And our little handles on the side just tighten it down so it's nice and tight. Moving on to the back of the laser, we can immediately identify that we are using an FB4 laser projector. In most cases, you'll find a laser that is controlled by either ILDA, DMX, or FB4. DMX-based laser projectors, while usually very basic, are very simple to use directly from a console. They usually consist of a built-in SD content player, allowing mostly for playback of content that was shipped with the projector. And they also have a few simple parameters like color and speed that can also be controlled. Unfortunately for safety, many of these players do not include digital zoning, and if used incorrectly, could be unsafe. ILDA control is the foundation for laser projectors. ILDA lasers use a 25-pin DB25 connector on the back, called ILDA in the laser industry and DB25 in others. And that connector is what receives the control signal from the laser control software or hardware. These types of lasers were the standard, but come with a few core limitations. First, ILDA cable is expensive, and you can only run up to a maximum of 150 feet before the signal can start to drop off. This makes it hard to run large-scale laser shows or laser shows over a long distance. In addition, they can be difficult to interface into multimedia setups. Given that ILDA is an analog signal, it can be as feature-rich as your controller is, making it a favor for hobbyists and has been robust and relevant for many years back and likely many years to come. FB4, which is Penguin's modern digital-based laser controller, offers a wider range of features, such as direct software control, DMX and Artnet, or even things like standalone mode, where you can program content in the software and upload it for the projector to run on its own. Since it's network-based, it runs over Cat5e or higher, making it easier to find cable for. It can also be used with standard networking equipment, allowing for longer front-of-house runs, larger laser projector counts, and even the ability for telemetry back to the software. While there are other network-based laser controllers, FP4 is the most common. It's important to note that most network-based controllers are designed to work with a specific software. In our case, FP4 is designed to work with Pangolin Quickshow or beyond for streaming and content creation. Now, on the back of the laser projector, we can see first our power in and out. In this case, we're using PowerCon and our power button. More newer laser projectors are starting to use True One, which doesn't need a power button because it can click in with and start up without a power button. We can also see our safety features, which is our e-stop remote in and out. 
and our uh, key. We can also see our ILDA input here, our FB4 builds in, and our signal inputs for DMX in and out and Ethernet in and out. And on the quantum projector, we actually have a cool feature called Color Bounce, which sets the projector to its factory default color balance, which allows your projectors to all look the same. Now that we are inside of the laser, let's identify some of the essential parts and see what they do. Here we have the laser module. Think of the laser module as the light bulb of the laser projector. Inside the module is a laser diode, which is the physical laser source where the laser light is emitted. Those are generally produced in various wavelengths, which define the color. For example, 445 is blue, 520 is green, and 637 is red, and so on and so forth. The wavelength and corresponding colors can be seen on technical data sheets like this. The laser diodes are then combined together with optics and crystals or collimation cubes to produce a nice white laser beam. In an RGB module like this one, you have a combination of red, green, and blue diodes which come together to produce white all inside of one module. In higher power lasers, you might see an individual red, green, and blue laser modules that are combined together to create white. As we move on from here, you might also notice some small optics right inside of here. These are either optical grade mirrors, in this case, or dichroic mirrors. And they allow you to combine colors. So in those larger projectors, you have a red, green, and blue. You'll often have a few different dichroic mirrors, which allow you to combine that beam into, that, into the scanners, which we'll talk about next. Most laser projectors today use what is called direct diode or pure diode technology. This is common standard for laser projection equipment. More advanced lasers will use what is called OPSL technology. OPSL stands for optically pumped solid state. And these lasers have an incredibly high power density, allowing them to provide unprecedented laser brightness over long distances. You'll find such laser sources in higher power lasers, such as Kavant Spectrum series. But because of the higher power and quality, they are quite a bit more expensive than direct diode. Next, we have our optical scanning systems which primarily consists of galvos, scanners, and servo amplifiers. The optical scanning system is really the heart and soul of the laser projector. It consists of two small electric motors that have been placed inside of a mount on an XY axis, which have mirrors connected. The motors, as we refer to them as galvos, have a position detector on the back, which receives a control input from the servo amplifier. The servo amplifier is controlled by means of the laser control system like FB4 or ILDA. It is used to control the display. A few notes. When we refer to the term Galvo, it's simply another name for the optical scanner. Galvo is the more scientific term used when discussing the laser motor itself. The scanner is just another name for a Galvo, a name that derived as people saw the Galvo scanning the laser beam off of it. Then the servo amplifier is the drive electronic used to send the signal to the optical scanning system. The servo amplifier works in combination with the laser control system being used to control the movement and position of the laser beam. Once the scanners receive the signal, they move back and forth at rapid speeds, reflecting the beam, allowing you to create laser light. In very simple terms, you know if you take a laser pointer and move it back and forth really fast, it makes a line? Laser scanners are doing this at incredible speeds, which allows us to create all those effects we've been talking about. Now, how do you know if your laser scanners are good? The unfortunate truth is, truth is many manufacturers use many different methods to measure their scan speeds. It's easy to fudge the numbers. So let's take a look at a few different terms and talk about how we measure the quality and speed of a scanner. Scan speeds are mostly determined by one, the torque of the motor, two, the size of the load, which is the mirror, three, the scan angle, and four, thermal capacity. Also, KPPS is the general term used to denote speed in the laser industry. It is generally accepted that scan speeds be measured at seven to eight degrees optical. If you see a speed defined as less than this, be wary of that specification. Most scanners on the market should be able to scan at 30 kpps at eight degrees. And there are only a few scanners on the market that can do scan speeds faster than this. Scan speeds of some of Pangolin's scanner products are noted on screen. Note, it is important to know what size mirror has been mounted on for the rating, as a more powerful laser projector requires a larger mirror, and that can affect which scanner product your laser projector might use. Take this into account when you're looking for what laser scanner product is best for you. It's also good to make sure that your laser module includes Lasorb. Lasorb is a product that goes on directly on top of laser diodes, 
What this does is absorb different levels of static and can help your laser last longer and stay brighter. Penglin has also wrote a book about all of this, which we recommend you read if this technology interests you. You can find a free copy link in the description. So now that you know all of this, what are you actually looking for when you buy a laser projector? Well, first and foremost, you have to make sure that it is safe. You have to make sure that the laser meets all the safety regulations in the area in which you'll be using it. And make sure you're purchasing from a company which can properly educate you on the safe way to use the device. Safety is paramount in the laser industry, and we all need to take it very seriously. Sites like regulations.gov, FDA.gov, and the German TUV, and others are great places to check if your supplier is certified, safe, and compliant. You should evaluate the specifications. It's easy to lie on a specification sheet. Feel free to ask what scanners, modules, and control equipment your manufacturer of choice uses. Look for videos of the projectors, reviews from customers, and do your research. This can be an expensive purchase, and you want to make sure you're comfortable with your choice. You can also ask around. There are forums, we've linked to a few below, where you can get great third-party reviews on lasers from real operators. Also look at the company's websites and see if they have testimonies and reviews as well. Chances are, if they do, then there's a good reason why. You should definitely research the company. Do your homework on the organization you buy from. Make sure they're an established company and have the resources and network in place to support you. We strongly advise against buying laser projectors on sites like eBay, Alibaba, and others, as we've seen many of our clients get taken advantage of. It's always best to buy direct from the manufacturer. While you might save a buck or two on those sites, peace of mind is worth a lot, and with lasers, having a relationship with a supplier who will work with you and support you is worth its weight in gold. And obviously, we are Pangolin, so if you still need help, feel free to contact us. We've been in business for over 30 years, and elements of our laser systems are used to power over 90% of the world's laser shows. We also offer our own line of lasers together with Quant, and as well, we are working with nearly all laser projector manufacturers worldwide to integrate our control systems. At the end of the day, we'll always give you fair, honest, and real feedback on what type of laser is the best for your application, even if it means referring you to another company. On behalf of everyone here at Pangolin Laser Systems, we hope you enjoyed the video. Remember to check out the links below for awesome free resources, as well to join us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. Take care, and we'll see you next time.